like, if we don't have a problem with all those other stuff that we talk about in Scripture, theology, whatever you want to call it, we shouldn't have a problem. Uh, I'm going to step on the toe. All right, Daddy. You know, I've got to be real careful, praise God. You, you know who has a problem when people talk about the blessing? I'm trying to set you free this morning. Listen to me. You know who has a problem with talking about money? Nope. People with no money. That's absolutely truth. Because people that are wealthy, that understand the principle of the blessing, you see it more and more in their life. And you see God continue to bless them. It's a biblical principle, man. You can't take away from it. Okay? Jesus shows over and over again in his principles he took from the guy that had none and he gave it to the one that did something with it. The ones that we struggle with are the ones that have this. And this is what it is, guys. Listen to me. I'm going to set some people free from a spiritual stronghold this morning. It's an orphan mentality. It's an orphan spirit. And this ain't even the notes. This is free today. An orphan mentality is because we don't understand who our father was. And we don't understand who we are in Christ now. And because we've been burned and we've been hurt and we've been broken for so long, we believe that we believe the lie that that's who we're supposed to be. And so when we think about a God that loves us, that wants to shower blessings upon us, it is so foreign to us that we resist it because we're comfortable in what we're in or who we are. And God wants to break through that so that you can live out the life that you were created to live. A person that is sick and dying of cancer has a hard time praying for someone else who's sick. God wants to heal people. He is a God that heals. Why does it not work for some and why does it work for others? I do not know that. I just know what his word says. Okay? That's what I know. I don't have all the supernatural answers, man, that some of you guys are longing for. What I will tell you this, man, is that God loves you. You're his son. You're his daughter. And he wants to do great things in your life. He wants to impact the kingdom of God through you. And he can't impact the kingdom of God through you when all you are focused on is next month's rent. Listen to me this morning, church. This isn't a prosperity message. This is a message to set you free so that you can see who your dad really is. He's not a mean God up there bullying. He didn't take your job. He didn't make these bills happen. What happened was we did it. We put ourselves in situations in our lives, and we stopped listening to God, and we started going, this might be a good idea. This might be a good idea. And we left him. We abandoned him. And God said, wait a minute. I got a better plan for you. Oh, I know you got a better plan, but that's going to take more commitment than I'm ready to have. And we, we jack things up. And so then we get mad at God because God says, look, I've got a principle in place. If you'll only do this principle, this is what will begin to happen in your life. And it's in there. I've got it in my notes, man. You can't do it just, I've had people say this, well, I've tried that giving. See, right there, and and, and just in that phrase that you just said, the problem with that phrase is that you're trying something, you're not committed to something. That means you, you, your heart's not in it yet. And you, let me tell you something. The Bible says this. God doesn't care about this outward exterior. He looks at the heart. And he knows your heart before you know it sometimes. Amen? Listen to me, church. God loves you. I know this is like something. This is, I mean, it can be taken almost borderline, you know, prosperity preaching, man. But the principle is the truth. When we understand what he's saying in his word. And some of you might say, well, Pastor Mike, I, am, I can't give, I, don't, I can't do this right now. I, I tell people this. I've had so many people say, well, I can't afford to give. You can't afford not to. I didn't write this stuff. I didn't create this 2,000 years ago. Dad did. And it's not to beat us up and it's man to live out the life, the purpose that God has for you. In this room, I see missionaries. In this room, I see Sunday school teachers. I guess we can use that phrase. We don't really do Sunday school teaching. But in this room, I see evangelists and pastors and prophets and healers and musicians and worship leaders. And guess what? You're so wrapped up financially, man, in other things. You can't live out the free life that's for you. Amen? 
God says, man, I've got a better plan. I've got a better purpose. But in order for that to take place, you've got to understand my covenant. You've got to understand my covenant. My goodness. Write this down in your worship guide, the second note there. Heaven's treasures are sometimes hidden. And that's really where we're coming from this morning, is that sometimes treasures are sometimes, heaven's treasures are sometimes hidden. What does this mean? It means that God's blessings will not necessarily just fall from the sky. I hear people say, well, bless God, I gave, and I'm sitting on the couch watching Oprah waiting for God to give me a job. (laughs) Well, I gave twice last week. I tipped God that $10. Man, I don't understand why I'm not financially uh, finding that new job. I want God to bless me, man, but I'm not going to get the the want ads or go get on the pavement and go look for a job. And then listen and pray and seek out dad's, what dad's will and purpose is for my life. See, what we do is there's an act of faith and obedience that we do. And then from there, even the book of James says that. He says, show me a man that has faith and no works, and I'll show you a man who has faith and works. So we don't just sit back and go, okay, well, I gave. Why ain't God bless me? Because you ain't doing nothing. You sitting at home eating bonbons and jujus, man, watching Oprah, man, and Dr. Phil looking for answers. You got to search out these things. Sowing seed. Sowing seed, man. Remember the kernel? You got to sow seed. You have a financial need. You want the same DNA results in the harvest? You sow financial seed. You have a healing need. You sow healing seed. You have a relationship problem. Sow the things that God says to sow into that relationship. Be friendly. Love your enemies. Do good unto them. Bless those that curse you. See, the Bible's filled with seed time stuff. You want this kind of harvest, what are you planting? Some of y'all, man, some of y'all are... are, I'm so guilty of this. I'm so guilty of this, man. I I plant, I plant, follow the, the parable. I plant bananas over here, and I'm praying God give me apples. And I can't understand why my apple tree ain't turning into bananas. Because I'm sowing bananas. If I want apples, sow apples. Now you can put that into every area of your life, church. You don't have friends? Sow relationship. Open your home up. Love on people. Give to people, man. Give, man. Don't, and, and give without expecting back. Just love people. That me? I'm like, yeah, of course it's you. Who else is it? No one else got a mic. Deuteronomy 28, 12, and uh, 23, two passages of Scripture here. It says that the Lord will open to you his good treasure, huh, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hand. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. Verse 23 says, and your heavens which are, you see that? And your heavens which are over your head shall be bronze, and the earth which is under you shall be iron. In other words, there's stability. There's stability. Iron always represents strength. The windows of heaven. Isaiah 45 and 3 says, I'll give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places. One of my favorite passages of scripture that I'm not sure exactly where it is. I didn't put it in here. But it says that the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. The wealth of the, the, wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. What does that mean? It means when you're obedient and you do the things that God has commanded you to do, even the wealth of wicked people will come to you, man, it's yours. That's amazing to me how dad works like that. Malachi 3.10 again. It says, see if I will not open... And pour out. Another translation says, see if I will not throw open the window. I love this. It means to make suddenly and dramatically more accessible. To open forcibly with purpose. To allow a new movement. What was locked is now unlocked. A closed hand is now open hand. Closed womb is now an open womb. To reopen non-confining barriers. A new passageway. New admission. See, when he says he's going to do it, the responsibility now falls on him. And this is what he's doing. He's giving you a new access point. 
He's throwing open the windows of heaven. He's giving you a new access point. For some of you, it might mean that you need to work a second job. That's the access point for right now. For some of you, it might be that you, uh, you, you give in a certain ministry or you do something else. Maybe for some of you, it's that God says, look, I've given you this gift and this talent. You're not using it. Start using your gift or your talent. Access point. And then what happens is because it's hidden, it starts coming. I was like, man, sometimes it's that, it's that, that check that you thought that you owed the IRS and, and you overpaid the IRS. And all of a sudden you come home and Monday morning comes and you open up the, the mailbox and there's a check in there from the IRS. Yes, it happens. It does. It really does. All right? And there's, don't look at me like that. It happens. And all of a sudden there's a check in there that you didn't, weren't expecting. Why? A hidden access point. Or it might be somebody, man, that, man, I've heard so many things. I've heard people pray. Man, Rob and I have had needs that we've had that we've just said, God, we're just going to give this to you. And, and people go, hey, I don't, I don't know why I'm supposed to do this, but I need to give you this. And they hand you a check for the exact amount that you need. That's the way our dad works. He does it. Hidden access point that God does in our life. Man, God is so cool. My deal just shut off. Praise God. How do we do that? There it is. There it goes. All right. Isaiah 60, verse 11. Therefore your gates will open continually. They shall not be shut day or night. That men, watch this, that men may bring to you the wealth of the Gentiles and their kings in possession. Procession, I'm sorry. Psalm 78, 23 and 26. If that's not enough, let this. Yet he had commanded the clouds above and opened the doors of heaven, had rained down manna on them to eat, and given them on the bread of heaven. Men ate angels' food. He sent them food to the full. He caused an east wind to blow in the heavens, and by his power he brought in the south wind. Matthew three sixteen and 17. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting up, up uh, and a lighting, lightning upon him, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. We don't know the access point in which God will come down and bless you. He will open it up in so many different ways. Malachi 3.10, uh, 310 again, it says, and pour out. I love this. Floodgates are opened to pour out pouring out heaven's provisions like a mighty gushing torrent of water. To pour out literally means to empty out of a vessel completely emptied of its contents. Nothing is kept back, no blessing withheld. I, I, even another translation, it says, until the full, until you've had enough, until you can't contain it no more. So when God pours it out to you, he opens up the windows of heaven. The access point is our tithing, is our giving. That's the access to this window. What happens is he throws open the window, and then he begins to pour out of this window. So much so that you cannot contain. Man, this is good. Oh my goodness, I don't have time. Yes, I do. Pour out is provision. The Bible says that God is a Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah, I will be that, is necessary as the need arrives. And Jireh, I will see ahead of time and provide what is needed. God will open up his windows and pour out provision, not a trickle, but open up heavens with a gushing forth of God raining upon us. How many of y'all know God never did anything in small portions? Go back to the Bible, man. Go back to what is everything that he did. When he showed up, he did it in a big way. Expect God to do big. Genesis 22 and 14. Abraham called the name of the place. The Lord will provide. That Lord will provide means Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Psalm 65, 11. You crown the year with your goodness and your paths drip with abundance. Thank you. Ezekiel 34, 26, New Living Translation says, I will bless my people and their homes around my holy hill, and in the proper se season I will send the showers they need. There will be showers of blessing. Now, I want to keep that up there for a moment because I want to talk about this for a second. Because it's Old Testament, and it's really easy for us as Old Testament folks to kind of just bypass that and read on. But I want you to see something. It says, I will bless my people and their homes around my holy hill. 
Now, to understand what he is saying, I'm going to step on some theology for a moment. The holy hill, what was on the holy hill? Come on, scholars. Say it again, baby. Absolutely. She did not know. I did not give her the answer. We did not uh, collaborate before service. All right? She says the temple. All right, now. I will bless my people and their homes around my holy hill. The temple. This is the modern day temple. The church. Now, I know there are many, many, many churches out there. And there are many, many, many churches that are doing amazing things for God. The thing that I want to instruct you this morning as a pastor to you is be in the temple. When you are in the temple and you are connected in the temple around my home, he says, I'll bless my people and their homes around my holy hill. What happens is when you're, when you're serving, which is another form of what? It starts with a G, ends with ing. Thank you. So when you're serving and you're giving, that's a form of giving that you're giving out of your gift or your talent. What God says, because you're doing that, not because of Pastor Mike, but look around you. You're blessing other people, and because of that, your home will be blessed. We miss this, man. We miss it because, like, man, I had somebody today, and Robin and I had this conversation. I know that it's July 4th. We have a lot of family in, and everybody's family. And I, have, I get people that call me all the time and say, Pastor Mike, I'm not going to make it to church today. I'm like, okay, cool. And I don't ask them why. It, 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 I don't care. Um, and they'll say, my family's in town. I'm like, well, you're not proud of our church? You don't bring your family to church? Well, I just, I'm going to spend more time with them. You're talking about an hour. You can spend an hour in church and talk to them about Jesus or something like that? You know what I mean? I know. Somebody's saying, that, an hour? No, it's more like an hour and a half. I know. Okay, a little bit longer than an hour and a half. All right, praise God. Yes, I read lips very well from up here. <laughs> praise God. But uh, my point is this, man. You can bring your family to church. There's a, something happens when we do life together in church. There's something that happens. I know that Epic Life doesn't do everything right. Look, look around. I want everybody to stop for a moment and look at each other. They're people. And as long as they're people, they ain't perfect. And as long as we're Epic Life, we're going to have jacked up people walk in here, and they're going to do jacked up things, and they're going to do stupid things, and they're going to look a certain way, and they might not smell the way you're accustomed to smelling, and they might act a different way that you're not used to them acting. But guess what? They're people, and they're your family. I tell people all the time, you can pick your friend, but you're stuck with family. You're stuck with family. And guess what? I'm your family. Y'all stuck with me. Praise God. All right? Uh, let's see here. I'm, go, go back to Malachi chapter 3, verse 10 again. This is it. Pour out as much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. Blessings beyond your wildest dream. Another translation. Windows of blessings open up and pour out heaven. Surpasses, it surpasses power, prosperity, and accesses of favor. Do you understand that? It's not just about money. I want you guys to get that. The blessing that God, listen, this is something we taught last year. We did a, a message series called The Blessed Life. And one of the things we talked about in that is that blessed people bless others. And so we said, well, I don't have anything to give. Yes, you do. You give what you can. Let God bless that. You realize, man, that the greatest story ever told in the Bible was of a little old lady who gave everything that she had, and Jesus looked at that and said, just because of what she gave, Everyone will talk about this for thousands of years. You get that? She didn't give a bunch. Man, they... In the old days, in the temple, when, when the giving was required, then they would open up, they would have like this big brass giving thing up here, right? And so people would have to go through the, and if you, if sometime do a study on the temple, on the old temple, and you can see the picture of the temple, and they walk up the stairs, and they go into the holy, or not the holy of holy, but where they were allowed to go, and they go into, and as they went into, the, the religious leaders and the people in the church would kind of sit back on the sides, and they'd watch, yeah, we don't do it like that, we got, man, got my, my giving envelope, right, I'm going to, sneaking on in there, right, but back in the day, they used to like the religious, the, uh, the rabbis and the temple people would all sit on the side, right? And they'd be like, they'd be all checking out and be like, oh, yeah, what's up? What's up? What's up? Right? And so the Pharisees, all the religious people, 
they'd come over there and you'd hear ding, 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 you know, like the, I don't know, like they won a thing at the circus or something, right? And they'd sit there and they could, because they loved hearing that sound, because it made them sound like they were rich, right? But Jesus and the disciples are sitting over here watching all of this stuff take place. And the widow comes in, and she just drops her little mite in there. And she dropped it in there, ding, that was it. And Jesus recognized what was going on. And he publicly tells everyone, he said, see this woman? He points her out. He pointed her out. He said, see this woman? Because of what she gave, she gave out of what? She gave out of her lack, and they gave out of their abundance. But because of what she gave, people will talk about this. Man, every time they remember her, they'll talk about this. I want you to get the principle that God works upon. It's not a... The tenth is the tenth. Okay, we talked about that last week, right? But here's what we got to get through our heads. It's not about the amount of what you give compared to someone else. It's about this right here. See, that's the new covenant. The new covenant is about generosity. See, generous people are blessed. They are. People that understand that they are stewards and not owners are blessed people. It's that people, the orphan mentality kicks in when we start thinking everything's mine. What is a five-year-old? I've got a two-year-old. He walks in the door, praise God. The first thing he, he's been gone from Mimi and Papa for a little bit. First thing he does, go to a little four-wheeler. Mine. Sees his blanket. Mine. Sees anything in the house. Mine. No, that's my couch, not yours. You can't take it with you. Right? He's got this word mine now. Why? Orphan mentality. Maybe he's in competition. So we develop the same type of mentality in our life. Mine, mine, mine. But when we understand that none of it belongs to us, none of it does. It belongs to Dad. And Dad says, hey, if you'll be a faithful steward of this, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'll do. And it's not because you're a righteous person. It's not based up, it is not based upon how spiritual you are. It's based upon how faithful you are. Not about how you can quote the New Testament. It's about how faithful you are. So the, the, the whole idea of creating a culture of expectancy and being seed time and harvesters is learning to be people of generosity. That's a heart transplant. That requires a heart transplant. Because you can even get to heaven and go, well, God, I gave a tenth of my money every week. I was faithful, man. And God can say, you know what? Depart from me, man. Your heart is not for me. You did it out of just like a religious person. So God wants a heart of generosity. That we become generous people in our gifts, in our finances, in our talent, in our abilities. Maybe some of y'all are called to preach and you're not preaching. Some of you are called to serve and you're not serving. Some of you are called to love and you're not loving. Some of you are called to, to do things and you're not doing it and you know it. See, an attitude of generosity man goes over every area of our lives what are you sowing this morning and I can go on this thing is just like man I'm trying to turn it off really I ain't watch there we go I want us our church this church man one thing I am so proud of of epic life is that we truly are a church that loves people I hear that all the time. I heard this morning, and I, I think it was, uh, can I share that what you told me the other night? Can I share that? Is that okay? She said, man, and it just, man, it melted my heart. She said, this is the first church that I, what was the word you used? Healing, that was the word. She said, she said it was the first church that I found healing at. That's awesome, man. We want to continue to do the work that God has come to do. It means that all of us have to do our part. See, the church isn't about Pastor Mike, a little preaching a message on Sunday, and then we go about our normal life. The church is about the body of Christ acting like the body of Christ. And that means being generous in every area. Don't tell me, man, you're being generous in this area, but you're not being generous in this area. God wants to work on everything, and it begins. If you can learn, and you talk to wealthy people about this. Listen, you talk to wealthy people. If you can learn to be generous with your finances, you'll be generous in every other area of your life. And there are people in this church that you can talk to. 
that will tell you that's exact truth. Because that's how dad operates. He doesn't operate like you and I do. So the challenge for this week and for this entire message is a couple of things. One is this. If you're not a tither, I challenge you to test God and see if he'll not open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you cannot contain. If you're not a tither. And if you are tithing, then here's the challenge. To sow seed into this ministry so that we can continue to do and fulfill the role that God has for us in this church. And whatever that might look like for you, I'm not telling, I'm not going to sit up here and talk about, give me, give me, give me. I'm not doing that. Listen, you talk to dad, you pray about it, you deal with it. We don't take up an offering. I think in the three years we've taken up, I don't see Anthony, he's back there. We've taken up maybe one for a, a couple that had cancer or something like that, and they had to do a hospital visit. Wasn't that somewhere they had to fly out? So I think it's the only time we've ever taken up a public um, giving, and it was actually for someone else. But us as a church, no, you know why? I believe God speaks to you just well as he speaks to me. And I believe if you'll be faithful, then God will bless you. This is good soil to sow seed into. We're a small church, but we're growing and we're impacting the kingdom of God like never before. We're seeing people getting delivered. We're seeing people be set free. Corporate prayer is flipping this place upside down. If you've not been to corporate prayer, man, it is amazing to see what God's doing through corporate prayer. The children's ministry, amazing things. We have a whole other office space back here that we want to take and, and begin to work on. That we're going to move all of our office so give us more room for our children's ministry up front. And take my office back there, open up the cafe a little bit more so we can minister and serve more people. We can't do that without you. Let's turn this place upside down where we become a place that expects. Maybe you have a negative family. Maybe you're negative in your speech, man. Ask God, put a guard over my mouth. Put a guard over my heart. Put a guard over my ears. You know something? I don't need to say that. Praise God. I was going to say, you know, you don't always have to speak what comes to your mind. <laughs> praise God. That's, a, that's another message. We'll preach that another time. Begin to believe God wants to do good stuff in and through you. Everybody stand to your feet this morning.